So I am very pleased to be able to talk today about uh, where we're going forward in our program using the AstraZeneca uh, COVID shield vaccines that we have now in British Columbia. As, as you know, uh, we um, had said from the very beginning that once uh, we had a fridge stable vaccine that would allow us the flexibility to use in more places around the province, we would be targeted at frontline workers and workers in specific at risk workplaces and industries. We now have uh, two vaccines that have been approved by use, uh, for use by Health Canada, one of which we've had uh, in the province, and that's the AstraZeneca or Covishield, which is the Serum Institute of India version of the same vaccine. It's approved by Health Canada and now by NASI for use in adults over the age of 18. And our BC Immunization Committee has been tasked with providing us with the best advice of where we can make the most difference and how to start the use of this vaccine. So the rollout is in two parts, the first of which started just this week. Um, the part one was the COVID shield that we received, 68,000 doses that we received last week. Um, that has now uh, been started to be used in places across the province, and I'll provide more de details about that. In addition, we now uh, know that we will be receiving another close to 300,000 doses uh, starting, uh, we hope, the last week of March, but uh, we don't have that pinned down quite yet. Uh, so it will be the last week of March or the first week of April. And 136,000 doses of the COVID shield in mid-April and another 68,000 doses um, in May. So those are the, what we are using now to plan the part two of this uh, use of this new and effective vaccine. We also heard today on uh, media reports that we might be getting additional doses from the United States. So uh, that will allow us to actually speed up again some of those processes. So this is uh, our updated progress uh, using the phases that we have uh, uh, had from the very beginning. And what we're focusing on right now is that uh, gray box down in the bottom, which is the priority frontline workers or people who work in specific industries that are at risk. The part one, which I've just uh, mentioned, based on uh, the 68,000 doses that we received last week, this is being deployed based on what we know from public health and from uh, uh, the WorkSafe BC and Public Health Workplace tax Task Group that I put together last November to help us address the ongoing issues that we were seeing in many workplaces around COVID-19 outbreaks and helping boost and uh, the COVID safety plans to prevent outbreaks. But we do know that there are a number of industries that are more at risk and they are having ongoing and repeated outbreaks. They have unique issues where it's difficult to have physical distancing, where wearing of PPE becomes challenging um, because of the nature of the work that people are doing. And we know that they're susceptible to ongoing outbreaks and uh, poultry uh, plants are, are one of the ones that come to mind. As well, we know that we have ongoing risk and outbreaks um, associated with congregate housing facilities for workers, uh, whether it's agricultural workers, whether it's uh, uh, workers in some of the resort communities, for example, in Whistler or Big White. So our delivery method in the past week has been around uh, using on-site clinics so that we are able to target workers directly and, and that will continue. And for some workers, um, it's, uh, we've managed to move them in, in a separate stream through some of our, our clinics. So where have we seen uh, this, uh, this rollout so far? The key sectors that we know are the most challenging in terms of managing of outbreaks are food processing plants, and we've seen outbreaks that have affected many people uh, in poultry processing, food, vegetable, fish, and meat processing around the province. We know as well that the agricultural operations that have the congregate worker accommodations in farms, nurseries, and greenhouses that are so essential to keeping food on the table across this province. And this is highly supported by our temporary foreign worker program um, that in BC we've been supporting through providing of uh, a centralized uh, quarantine services where temporary farm workers who are so necessary for, uh, for this work are uh, quarantined safely and provided what they need. 
and we'll be uh, looking at immunizing and just started that program, uh, immunizing those workers so that when they go into our communities, um, we don't see the outbreaks that we saw last year. As well, we know that there's been challenges with the large industrial camps and we put in place a provincial health officer order around industrial camps to enhance the measures that are put in place and despite that we know that there were challenges um, with workers who come in and out from communities around BC and from other parts of Canada and they bring the risk with them to these congregate living settings in these accommodations and the large camps and they take the risk back home with them. So we have been working um, particularly in the north and the interior to address um, the, the risk in those worker populations. We have other large congregate living settings, particularly, as I mentioned, in resort community where isolation and quarantine is very challenging and where young people um, are having uh, difficulty with um, maintaining uh, the distance and the, the isolation that's needed with these ongoing outbreaks. And additionally, we have uh, a number of workplaces and industries, including manufacturing, warehousing, distribution, where we have ongoing clusters and outbreaks occurring. Generally, they're larger sites. We're focusing on those where we can make the most difference with preventing the second generation transmission in those outbreaks. And we've seen some of those uh, be responded to in this past week. And I know that um, there's sometimes um, some frustration expressed when we are immunizing people and uh, uh, workers who have an outbreak or have been exposed in a, a large Costco or a glass manufacturing. But these are all places where we know there's been exposure, where we know that transmission between workers um, also puts our communities at risk when people go home. Um, and it is in all of our best interest to protect everybody in that situation. So what have we been doing? The part one, uh, focusing on these, including in, in Vancouver Coastal Health, about 16,000 doses to people working in 53 identified food processing facilities, six industrial sites, and five congregate living settings, as well as uh, the temporary foreign workers who are in isolation in the Richmond area. In Fraser Health, where the largest proportion of these sites are, uh, we're um, working on immunizing in 71 food processing plants, 48 farms, nurseries and greenhouses, and a number of industrial work sites uh, with outbreaks. Interior Health has a smaller uh, group of people primarily focused on industrial work camps uh, and food processing and a number of uh, larger farms and nurseries with shared accommodations. When we look at Northern Health, um, as I mentioned, that's where a large industrial camps have, have uh, meant ongoing risk to neighboring communities as well as outbreaks in the camps themselves. Uh, Island Health doesn't have as many of these types of settings, um, but there are four of the large food production facilities that will be targeted. And then we have some doses in reserves for those um, larger outbreaks that we're trying to manage in different parts of the province. As we move into the second part, when we receive the next shipment of uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, which is, as I mentioned, we're expecting the last week of March or the first week of April, we are going to be re refining and moving out to a new group of people as well. So the target groups and the management of outbreaks will continue. All of the, the important things that we're looking at is all of our data needs to be entered into our, our provincial immunization registry on a daily basis. This is critical for all of us and it is something we have focused on from the very beginning, making sure that every dose, every lot number that everybody receives is in our provincial registry not only so that you have a record of what vaccine you received and when, but it's an important part of our safety monitoring. So we monitor that information by lot number by every vaccine on an ongoing and daily basis so that we're able to see if signals arise. And we know um, this is uh, the same process that's happening around the world. We share information and uh, we've heard about some of the concerns expressed uh, with uh, with vaccines in Europe and it was a safety signal from this type of monitoring that allowed them to, to uh, 
take a, a pause and look at and assess those instances. And we're um, very pleased that we have not seen any of the same types of issues here in British Columbia. Um, in Canada, we've seen one clotting event related to uh, AstraZeneca that was, uh, sorry, related, temporarily related to uh, vaccination, but not related to the vaccine. And uh, again, today, EMA, the uh, European Medicines Association, has come out with a strong support for the risks of uh, vaccination being very low compared to the risks that we have with ongoing transmission of COVID in our communities right now. Uh, the eligibility of people for these uh, these uh, programs will be validated before they're immunized, and it is important for us in public health to ensure that people recognize how getting vaccine as quickly as possible into as many people as possible helps break those chains of transmission, those clusters and outbreaks in our community, as we are working at the same time with the bulk of our program to protect those people who are most at risk. And we'll have some more information about that coming up. So any of the vaccines that are not yet used from part one will be added into uh, the initiative in the part two. We know that people who are uh, affected are people who live across uh, the province in different sectors. Our implementation is going to be more flexible now using um, partners in our community. And I have asked and tasked our, our BC Immunization Committee with looking at all of the recommendations that we have from national bodies, from looking at our outbreak and uh, case data that we have here in BC, and importantly, using our ethical framework for vaccines um, that helps us determine uh, the, the parameters that we want to use to identify who should be uh, uh, immunized first in this part of our parallel program. So with that in mind, what we are looking at is the priority groups for part two, starting in April, will be first responders, police, fire, and those who work in our emergency medical transport, um, where we know uh, that maintaining that workforce is an important service, and we have these duty of reciprocity. We'll be focusing as well on K-12 education staff and child care staff in both licensed and family child daycares across the province, as we know how important it is and how critical it is for families and communities across the province that safe child care and in-person education is for us all. And the amazing job that we know the early childhood educators, our educators, and our child care providers have been doing throughout this pandemic. We will also be focusing again on those uh, higher risk um, industries where we're seeing challenges, including manufacturing, and there's sectors that have been uh, where outbreaks have been ongoing and have been identified. Wholesale and warehousing, including uh, particularly food warehousing. Staff and congregate housing, as I mentioned, some have been addressed uh, starting in the, the part one of this program. Correctional facility staff, again, some of the staff have been addressed because we've had ongoing outbreaks in, uh, in our provincial correctional services and federal correctional facilities. And the, uh, the inmates in the federal correctional facilities are covered under the federal program, but both federal and provincial staff will be uh, covered under this program. As well, we're looking at uh, cross-border transport and we're working with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure to identify exactly uh, who the, the groups are at risk in these communities. Um, smaller groups of people, including our quarantine officers and bylaw officers, We'll be looking at uh, postal workers, um, as we know that that is also an environment where we're seeing ongoing outbreaks. And many of us, of course, are dependent on uh, uh, the, the packages that get uh, sent around the, the country these days. And uh, finally, uh, grocery store workers. And we'll be defining those um, more clearly for people as we, um, as we work through this. There will be, hopefully, some uh, as well uh, that we can use to continue to target those outbreaks um, that we're seeing now. So this is approximately 320,000 workers identified in these target groups. Some will already have been started to be immunized in this part one that we're doing right now. And we've been working on the scenario of about an 80% uptake. 
Um, as I mentioned, this is a fridge-stable vaccine, so that means we can use the infrastructure that we have in our community, um, and particularly our community providers, uh, pharmacies as, uh, in, uh, specifically, and we've been working with the pharmacy associations to make sure that we can do this in an efficient way, and we know that there are many pharmacies and pharmacists who have been part of our influenza immunization program that are ready and able to take this up. About 60 percent, as you can see from our targeted groups, are people who can be identified through their identification uh, um, related to their work. And then we'll be focusing our, the remainder of the activities on the 40 percent uh, where we will be uh, doing health authority driven clinics on site, some of which have started already. So this allows us to really move ahead with our large shipment of this vaccine to target these groups of people um, who we know are essential for keeping our, our communities going and who uh, have been working throughout this pandemic. And I know there are many other groups that fall into this category as well. And as more vaccine becomes available and our age-based program moves along, we'll also be targeting additional worker groups as we need until um, we get everybody in BC who wa wants to be immunized over the age of, of every adult in British Columbia and in the coming months. And until then, as the Premier has mentioned, we all need to do our part. Do our part to keep us going, to reduce the transmission in our communities as we protect more and more people through the use of our immunization programs. I'm now going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Baum to talk about then optimizing our deployment. Thanks so much, <clears throat> Dr. Henry, Premier, Minister. It's a privilege to be here today and very exciting to just be able to share with you the really remarkable progress that we're making as a province, um, getting everyone to get the jab, as we say. So th this slide is a familiar one for you. It, it lays out the phases of our campaign that we've been working on. And I think what's critical today is, you know, you've heard Dr. Henry speak about the AstraZeneca and Covishield vaccine and the target groups. And I, I want to share with you more detail on the more familiar vaccines that we've been working with since December, the Moderna and, and Pfizer, and how the decisions that have been made and the supply that's arrived just since we last spoke March 1st um, have really upped the opportunity for us to continue to protect our public. So just to give you a bit of a sense of, you know, how we're doing, there's been a total of 444,000 uh, doses of vaccine administered to our BC public, uh, mostly on age cohorts, as you know, but also in our priority populations over the work we've done in phase one and phase two. And, you know, you can see that Pfizer vaccine uh, so far is the majority of the vaccine that we've used um, with Moderna in, in second place. And, you know, just to share with you the, the volumes that we're now moving to in the last couple of days since we started our mass immunization clinics for our, our population in, in their 80s and 90s, uh, we've, we're doing about 20,000 vaccinations a day um, in British Columbia. So that's a remarkable, remarkable increase. And uh, you can start to see the numbers <clears throat> starting to ratchet up as we're moving people through all of the clinics around the province. So, you know, really understanding what's happened since March 1st. On March 1st, we, we shared with you that we had about 415,000 doses of Pfizer and Moderna coming to the province. And uh, we were, we described the, you know, the rollout of our phase two, which was priority populations and our age-related cohorts over 80 and our indigenous people over the age of 65. But since that time, just in these last couple of weeks, we have gone from 415,000 doses to actually now a projected supply for March and the middle of April to the middle of April of actually close to a million doses of vaccine. So really a doubling of what we can expect. So, um, you know, and essentially we, we also have the added AstraZeneca COVID shield vaccine that Dr. Henry's already talked to you about. We do know that Johnson & Johnson um, has approved, uh, their vaccine has been approved in Canada. We have no uh, 
line of sight at this point into what supply Canada will be bringing forth or when it will arrive. So I think it's, you know, one of the fundamental um, pieces of information here is that we're in a very fluid environment, as the Premier said. Things are changing as we as we go through our days and weeks and, you know, the, the job that we have in our health sector um, and our, our partners who are helping us deliver this campaign is we have to be nimble. We have to be able to react to these changes and, you know, continue to clarify and keep our focus on our objective, which is to get our population vaccinated and protected, to protect our workers and to keep our health system, you know, strong and, and protected from COVID and, you know, to, to actually carry on addressing the pandemic because it's still with us um, until we get our, our herd immunized. So this, this slide actually shows you a little bit of the elephant that we're going to be swallowing between now and, and the, you know, the middle and end of April. You can see that the, this very rapid rise in the amount of available vaccine in the space of just a month and a half. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm very happy to report that our, our whole program for immunization has been able to adjust to this. And what I'm gonna share with you is, you know, what that means for our public um, in terms of their ability to get vaccinated. So if you, just, just looking at this slide, you can see in the pink, that's the Pfizer vaccine. And you can see the rapid increase in Pfizer and the gray is Moderna. And then the black uh, part of the slide shows the AstraZeneca Covishield vaccine that will be coming to us. So in the next slide, I'm gonna just walk you through a little bit of the math around here because one of the important things when you're rolling out an immunization campaign and staffing up clinics to do it is, and, and in you know the many, many communities around our province where this has to happen, it's not linear, it's all happening pretty much at the same time and in a, in a complex schedule. So we really have to know what vaccine we have available and where we have to have it located and then what's the target population that we're reaching in those communities around the province. So at a very high level, the vaccine supply we had, you know, if we took March 12th as the starting date, date of our analysis, we had about 75,000 of vaccine on hand that had just arrived late in the week. Um, we have Pfizer shipments coming in between March 12th and April 18th of about 661,000. And then we have Moderna shipments, which as you'll remember, come every two to three weeks, arriving between the same period of time, March 12th to April 18th of about 170,000. And that total is just under a million, 906,059 units. And you know, as you know, the, the change that allowed this to happen was really increased supply and the shift from, uh, and the extension of the dose two, because as soon as we extended dose two to 16 weeks, what that allowed us, it freed up, you know, thousands of doses of, of these vaccines to allow expanded um, access for vaccination to our population uh, by dose one, which as Dr. Henry has described, is very, very protective. So um, basically, if you go back to our original plan that we rolled out on March 1st, we were launching the vaccination of the over 80s, the over 65, our indigenous population, in some areas, we know, we describe that the communities would be vaccinated actually as a whole in very small communities around different parts of our province. It's not, it's not a good use of time or resources to come back several times. And so in those communities, usually less than 2,500 will vaccinate the whole population when our teams arrive from the health authority. We continue um, on an ongoing basis to vaccinate our priority populations. You'll have heard that Many health workers, particularly now in the community, are being vaccinated, our, our allied health professions, our, our nurses and uh, support workers who are looking after people on long-term home support, a whole array of direct care providers in our community, physicians and so on. And we continue to work across the province with the First Nations Health Authority. I'm really happy to report that we're you know, well underway to finish off by the end of March all our our First Nations sites, our reserve communities across the province. So very, very good news for a population that we know has uh, an increased level of adverse events from this virus. So looking at the available supply of vaccine and taking away the plan that we already had underway, we have about just over half a million doses of Pfizer and Moderna that we now had to decide, okay, how are we gonna use these? So if you go to the next slide, 
Um, just to remind you, although this, these present just logistical challenges to our sector to, on a, on a very short timeline, get this rolled out, it's an incredible opportunity for our province in terms of getting back to normal because this is another half a million people that are going to get vaccinated in a, in a very near time frame. It allows us to move up those age cohorts that we had sort of set out to through April, May and June. And, you know, really we're just expediting the, the protection of our public. So it's very, very good news for both the general population, Indigenous peoples, and as you've heard from Dr. Henry, our workers. So when looking at how we were going to use this vaccine in a short time frame, um, we're going to move up the next age cohort from 70 to 79. And although we were, we were going to start on those uh, individuals in April, uh, we're now able to move some of them up into this, this month, into March in our clinics. We've already undertaken to expand the clinics that were set up for the over 80s. And we will be welcoming and, you know, basically going out to the public to tell people in their, and we'll start with the 75 to 79 cohort and just let them know that we will be in a segmented way uh, asking them to call in and make their appointments in the coming days. So just looking at the math, it's about close to 350,000 that we expect will be coming in to get vaccinated in their 70s. Now, we have another group that Dr. Henry has, has referenced on a number of occasions, and that's our ex clinically extremely vulnerable group. This is a group of about 200,000 individuals. About 50,000 of those actually will be covered in the older age group in the, in the 70s, 75 to 79, and some of them will already have been vaccinated in the 80-year-old age group. But beyond that, there's a remaining 151,000 and those individuals, you know, cross all age ranges. And you'll remember that we laid out the different categories they fall in back in January. They're people who are on, um, you know, very powerful immunosuppressants, uh, organ transplant recipients who are still on immunosuppressants, people in active uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, um, a whole array of, of groups that the, our medical community recognize are, are significantly at risk. And we'll be coming out in the, in the coming days to just make clear what those groups are. And, and those groups will be receiving, a, you know, a personalized letter from the, the ministry and the PHSA, who's in charge of this program, and let, advising them that they're eligible to get vaccinated regardless of their age. So between those two groups, we, you know, we will cover off the extra half a million doses of Pfizer and Moderna that are coming to us. When we look at the, the uh, feasibility for the different health authorities to actually ramp up this activity, um, I would say in the Lower Mainland, both Vancouver Coastal and Fraser have more large clinics. It, it's a bit easier and it will be faster for them to expedite um, opening up more capacity. And in the interior, the north and Vancouver Island, particularly in the northern part of Vancouver Island, you know, they'll be working hard with us to, to ramp up their activity, probably a bit more back end loaded toward the middle of April. So we're very confident that we are going to be able to use this vaccine in a, in a very timely expedited way to, to move up our population protection. So, you know, this, this slide just very simply walks you through the, the numbers um, of the different groups and, and shows you that at the end of it all, we, we have about 44,000 doses of vaccine that we will either have used up because we get more than 80% uptake, which is our, about our average, or we'll, we'll roll into um, the, the group receiving vaccines, the, the next age cohort after April 18th. I just want to, to note that we will be keeping a reserve of vaccine, and that's because um, it's, it's not uncommon for our, our Pfizer, and particularly for Moderna, which only arrives once in a two-week time frame, to come a few days late. And although during the first two phases of our campaign, we were able to manage that because we were working with our own staff um, who were getting vaccinated and, and different priority populations, and we were able to reschedule them and, and move on. But with the volumes now that we're going to be vaccinating and the, the fact that it involves, you know, large, large numbers of people in our general public, we do not want to be canceling vaccination clinics that have already been scheduled. And so we're keeping a bit of a reserve, about 140,000 doses, which is 
three days supply to actually make sure we've got that nimbleness and if the things arrive a bit late that we're able to fill in that uh, gap and proceed as planned with our scheduled clinics. The next slide just shows you, um, you'll, you'll have uh, seen in the last week, um, I think we all experienced uh, the call center issues we had on the first day of our rollout, which is uh, a very typical experience across our country and other jurisdictions around the world. You know, when you first open up your clinics to the general public, they're very enthusiastic, and that's good news. We want them to want to get vaccinated and to be getting in there to get an appointment. But it, it really challenges the technology of call centers and online registration. So, you know, what we moved to was a segmented process, and we've been working with our partners at our TELUS call center to segment the population. And I'm very, very happy to report that our public are, they understand the need for that, why it works better for them, it, we have virtually no wait times on our call centers this, this, the end of last week and this week, and yet we're, we're scheduling even more people every day. So segmentation of the age group seems you know, pretty practical and simple. And so this is just an example of what our planned schedule for segmenting our 75 to 79 age group for next week will be. And you know these things may shift a little bit, but essentially it's really about protecting our public from having to wait in long queues that are not necessary. If they wait till their their uh, age cohort is called by year and year of birth, um, you know they, they they will get a very fast response and be able to book their appointment. And what we know is, when people have an appointment booked, they they just relax and they they feel very very confident, and you know really much safer. And I just think that our experience really over the last week has been incredibly heartwarming. Um, seeing all these seniors come in and get their vaccination and really they're so happy and they're crying and it's just really been a remarkable thing for all our staff to just see just the impact of these clinics on our, on our population. Now going back to sort of the impact on the health authorities and just being able to understand you know what they'll be doing in order to respond to this increased vaccine um, on the top line of this slide, you see incremental clinic bookings. And essentially, you know, it's about 420,000 that we expect to drive through our immunization clinics. Um, and you can see by health authority the range of, of uh, you know, increased activity that they'll be managing, not just in one clinic, but in, in clinics spread around their whole geographic region. Um, with Fraser Health Authority, you know, having the highest amount, and that that basically relates to their large population. And interestingly, the interior, Vancouver Coastal, and Vancouver Island all have about the same number um, because that's because Vancouver Island and IHE actually have you know, even more seniors in their 70s than, than even Vancouver Coastal. So these things, you know, as you go through different age groups, you have to watch the impact on the different authorities and make sure that they've got the proper support to be able to respond. And the next line just really gives you an idea of you know, what the burden on a daily basis of additional clinic visits will be across our clinics. About half of the 150,000 clinically extremely vulnerable patients will, will come in through um, our clinics and the other half will, will organize their access um, through s different programs uh, across really provided by the PHSA. You know, many of the programs in which these patients reside are are run as provincial programs, the, the transplant program, our cancer centers, um, you know, small groups like patient, patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, they, they will then, um, the other groups, those with severe asthma and COPD, and those patients with severe diabetes, as examples, those people on immunosuppressants are quite large groups, and those we expect that they'll flow through our immunization clinics. You know, just a note about um, our smaller health authorities, they, you know, they are, they're working hard in, in every community because these patients are spread across our whole province um, to make sure that you know, as quickly as possible we're ramping up the capacity you know, to see these patients um, and, and our age cohorts um, into their clinics. So um, moving on to just deployment of the vaccine, I talked about the scheduling, we're very happy with our call center. Um, we will be bringing on online our provincial digital platform that I've talked to you about before. It's a great system. I think it's making very, Dr. Henry very, very happy. It's, it's basically a massive transformation of our ability 
in our immunization programs, you know, throughout the age groups and different, all different kinds of vaccines. This will allow us to track everyone. It will provide an opportunity a few months down the road for the public to access their vaccine records and for physicians and pharmacists to actually make sure they are able to vaccine, access those supplies when they're seeing patients. And I, I, we've talked about the AstraZeneca rollout as well and how that will happen, you know, in great partnership with our community pharmacies. So just moving on to this slide, because the, the, the transformation and transition to the provincial digital platform is a tricky, tricky business. Uh, as you know, we're working currently with five call centers in the health authorities, and they will continue to schedule people right up to April 18th and get them scheduled in all these clinics about there's about 198 clinics currently, and that will drop down a bit as we get our, our oldest seniors through. But, you know, in the range of 170 clinics around the province, and we will continue to schedule them through our five call centres over the course of the next few weeks. And then on April 6th, we will do the, the shift over, and we will close down those uh, five call centres and those numbers, and we will move to one provincial call centre and one... Um, very robust online booking platform and and the public will then start to be able to access wherever they are um, that online system and or the call center uh, who can help them book an appointment and that is what we will proceed through the rest of our um, vaccination and immunization program for COVID-19 uh, using that platform and just a little bit about that platform you know it will do it will allow people to go in and register pretty much at any time. We have mechanisms to gate that so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't collapse under the enthusiasm of uh, the remaining people to be vaccinated coming in. It will then allow you to schedule an appointment. You'll get a, a reminder that you can schedule an appointment. And the reason for that is we, we can gate that so we don't have everyone scheduling at the same time. And then it will actually run our clinics. We will, we will be using the same system in our clinics and tracking um, all the different work processes in the clinic. And finally, it will be a, a remarkable tool for reporting out um, for us to track our business and how we're doing and, and to continue to adjust our, our processes. So in summary, just um, uh, so this is our vaccination timeline now um, moving up. As you can see, uh, this is very, very good news for us. Uh, so, you know, in March, we will you know, we're continuing to do um, those who are aged 80 and Indigenous peoples. Um, you know, in April and even before April, we, we are probably going to get some people in their 70s into our clinics to vaccinate them as we, as we incrementally uh, bring on capacity. And in May, we'll, we'll be at, at a minimum, you know, pending new news about new vaccine arriving, people aged 59 down to 40. And in June, we'll get our younger group uh, vaccinated and you know this is remarkable progress if you think back to January when we were talking about September to get this done. Now we will have second doses and, and that, that will happen you know in a, in a structured way consistent with the evidence as Dr. Henry has indicated and in the meantime you can see in the yellow across the bottom of this slide that we'll have all of these different worker groups in the AstraZeneca COVID Shield program who will also contribute to the, the protection of our, our population. So in summary, um, as of March 12th, you know, we're looking at a, a bounty of vaccine, which is, you know, a remarkable opportunity. We are working very hard to respond to that and move up our population, accelerate their, their vaccination and their protection. This is a, a real benefit, particularly in the lower mainland where we, we have an outbreak that in, that is particularly difficult and, so it helps all of these things. It helps us manage our pandemic, protect our hospitals, and you know, advance the protection of our population. And by our calculation, just with the Pfizer and Moderna, without considering uh, the impact of AstraZeneca, we will have about a quarter of our population vaccinated by the end of next month. So the additional coverage um, by AstraZeneca will contribute to this, but you know, essentially this is good news for our public. Uh, very happy to be here um, you know, announcing this and there will be more to come. Thank you so much.